Hi, Ellen. How's it going? Really well. Thanks for talking with me. Oh, thanks for talking to me. Sure. I uh, love your book, and I love your uh, I love the title of the book, How to Be Yourself. You know, there's like it's very hotly debated in psychology what yourself is. First of all, you know what that e- what that word even means, and um, I like how you um, you you define it. So maybe you could you could do that for the audience a little bit. What does it mean to find yourself? How do you know when you found that? Sure. So without getting too much into like philosophy or like deep existential definitions. So the way the way I define it for the purposes of the book and for social anxiety is that your yourself is the self you are without fear. So you know we we all um, feel comfortable around the people we love or our closest friends or even just when we're in blissful solitude. And and so for folks who get socially anxious, it's often around, you know, people like authority figures or strangers. And so um, so again, for, for for this book, the definition of yourself is the self you are without fear when you're feeling comfortable. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Cause like the um the humanistic psychologists and all the, you know, like Carl Rogers and everyone, they're really interested in authenticity and they kind of talked about that real self self as being that 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 real live center within mm-hmm. yourself that Karen Horney uh, talked about it as well, like that. Yeah. So that so that's really the, what this is about in a lot of ways is finding that spontaneous creative center within yourself and um not being scared of it. Right, uh, right. The self yeah. that you are like without, you know, with We've all had that moment where we're, if we're in a you know socially anxious situation, we tend to turn inward. We tend to start monitoring our thoughts and think, like, oh, like, why did I just say that? Oh, I sounded like an idiot. Or, oh, gosh, I hope I didn't offend them. Or, like, does my hair look weird? Or, oh, he just, he just like, looked the other way. I wonder if he's looking for an escape route. And so <laughs> it's, it's, it's the self we can be when we're turned outward, when we're engaging with the world and not monitoring ourself and our performance. Yeah, I like this quote. Social anxiety is self consciousness on steroids. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not just it's not just run the mill self self consciousness, but you know, if you reach a level of social anxiety, you really are you know you need to regulate that a little better within yeah. yourself. Um, I'm fascinated with individual differences and uh, individual differences in this trait. So you're there are not everyone is self conscious, you know, and right. um, and and you can have the other extreme. You can have grandiose narcissism where yes, they exactly. don't. Uh, do you think Donald Trump? I don't want to get into politics, but do you think self <laughs> like every, like there are some people in this world where I don't think they really are that self conscious about what oh what I just said. I hope it didn't hurt someone's feelings, you know. Like so, I, so I, you know. What's really interesting for me in reading your book is like, you know, you want to help people get from like maybe negative seven to mm-hmm. what to to two. You don't sure. you don't want them. You know, like uh, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Right, right, right. I mean, it's just I think it's an interesting question. Like, what is the goal? Like, when do you feel like like with your patients? You know, it's like you know what I really think that um, you've reached a, a point where you just really do, this doesn't need to be a concern for you anymore because um, I I you know I personally and I, I would love to see what you think of this. I personally am of the belief that. Um, that self consciousness and self esteem that's that's like a deprivation uh mm-hmm. drive it's not a growth mm-hmm. drive so the goal the goal there is actually getting to the point where that's not even a need for you anymore you right. know where where and then you can really focus on the real things that help you grow like you know love and mm-hmm. exploration and right. all these other things so yeah it's just it's something to think about like is you know what's the optimal sort of point yeah, so it's it's interesting because um, it's funny you bring up like raging narcissism and whatnot because there have been studies to show like what is the opposite of social anxiety. Like if you turn social anxiety inside out, like a lot of people think. Oh, well, and also a lot of people who have social anxiety think, like, oh, I wish I wish I could just turn this around. I wish I could just be confident. Like they think confidence or like um, yeah, just a, 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 a more more confidence is the opposite of social anxiety. But really, um, according to brain scan studies, uh, psychopathy is the opposite of social anxiety. In yeah. that there's this there's this fearless dominance or this uh, kind of entitled narcissism. And so we're definitely not aiming for that. Like you said, we don't want to go from negative two or even negative seven all the way up to ten. We want to kind of inch it up the scale um, and. Also, I think inching it up the scale is is great because we, as we lose our social anxiety, we don't lose the things that often come along as a package deal with that social anxiety. Like a lot of the people that I work with in my office, 
who have social anxiety come in and are also very conscientious. They care about other people. Uh, they have a, a lovely openness to them. They've, they're quite agreeable, and, but they're, they're scared and self-conscious. And so as they work on that and face their fears, all those good traits don't go away, which is so great. And, and so it's, it's really, really neat to see them grow into themselves and be able to um, realize how great they are because that's that's when they come in there's well i mean this can get into the definition of social anxiety which is a lot of people think it's like a fear of embarrassment but that's really more like a consequence to the fear coming true so there's this the wonderful professor um, at the university of waterloo dr david moscovich who talks about the core fear of social anxiety being a that a deficit, a perceived deficit. I want to emphasize perceived. Yeah, yeah. Will be will be revealed and will become obvious to everyone. And so as a result, we try to hide, we try to conceal whatever we think is wrong with us, whether that's we're awkward or we're socially incompetent or we're boring or we're not funny. Just any any of a zillion perceived flaws. And and so he says that, that that is what social anxiety is. It's that urge to cover that perceived flaw. And so if we can help people realize that that, that perceived flaw is exactly that, is a perception, is actually a distortion, then that really sets them free and can help them inch along that scale. Yeah, you say that this book will help, related to that, you say this book will help you feel comfortable when you're, when you, you're caught being yourself. Now, right, that's a really, right. that's really <laughs> clever. That's a really clever phrasing, you know. Um, you know, you, right? It, it, that really encapsulates a lot of what you're saying because when you're when you're caught, that means you're like you're not uh, you're not being self conscious about mm -hmm, about who mm -hmm. the, of who you really are, right? You're, because you're being yourself, you know. Right, it's like right. it's not yeah. the performative aspect. Yeah, yeah. I really like that. You also say nothing is wrong with you, um, mm -hmm. and uh. uh I mean that that's an interesting question, but I mean there's some mm -hmm. patients where I I don't think that's true. I mean there's something sure. wrong with you, you know. Like, sure, like, sure. like uh, I, I I like to be honest, you know, yeah, with course, people, you know. So if you have high social anxiety, I mean that that's that's what's wrong with you, you know. Like, right. we, but we can we right. can, but the but there's nothing wrong with the the alive, unique, best self within you that needs wants right. to be expressed, right? Is that well, what you're and, saying? Yeah. And the and the fear. So when I say nothing is wrong with you, because because social anxiety is this is there is a there's a there's a perceived fatal flaw. Like people think that there's something like deeply wrong with them that they oh, have to conceal. But but really that thing that they're afraid of is something that either doesn't exist or exists to such a small extent that nobody really cares. Oh, like that we're all human, we're all boring at times. We all strip over our words, we all, you know, don't speak in eloquent full paragraphs, you know. And right. so and, right. and and so I think the the folks with social anxiety often think that they that they are deficient because of like these you know these perceived um problems yeah. but that really we're, we're just human it's just the foibles of and the blemishes of being a person and and so that that is what i mean by nothing is wrong with you thank you uh, that was really helpful and you you had me thinking of the amazing work of krista neff on self-compassion mm. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how one of her facets of self-compassion is sort of like common humanity or yes um, include and kind of recognizing that, and and so it seems like maybe with a lot of the individuals who are having social anxiety, high social anxiety, that maybe some self compassion exercises, meditations, things would be helpful. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, Dr. Neff was kind enough to to comment for the book, and yeah. uh, and she she talked about how you know we're all in this together, and you know we're all on this kind of long awkward journey <laughs> together. Oh yeah, and, absolutely, and uh, and so that I, I like to tell my clients that, you know, if there's ever an embarrassing moment you have, like, I can guarantee that millions of other people have had that same embarrassing moment. Even if you feel like you're the only one, you're, you're definitely not alone. So yes, Dr. Right. Neff is definitely onto something with that. <laughs> For sure. And then let's talk about the difference between like introversion and shyness, mm. because a lot of people conflate those two things. And you see it conflated in the, in the, uh, uh, like in communities online of introversion, like um, Susan Cain's uh, um, has a huge following, mm -hmm. and so you, you get all sorts of different types of introverts. Um, um, and you right. see, so to be introverted doesn't mean that you are necessarily having social anxiety, that, or there's something wrong with you if you are not as interested in in socializing with lots of new people as maybe other people are. 
right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So introversion and extroversion is more about where you get your energy. So extroverts recharge by being around people. They recharge by talking to others and interacting and being in groups. And introverts often recharge by being alone or one-on-one -on -one or with like a small group of people that they trust. And so that's, again, that's more about energy. Whereas uh, social anxiety, which just, you know, the everyday way of saying socially anxious is to say shy. Um, so those are really the same thing. Um, that's that's about fear. And that's about, um, again, wanting to conceal a perceived flaw. And so you can be a socially anxious extrovert. Like I, um, the, a person I like to talk about as an example um, is someone I met who is both a teacher and a stand-up comedian. And so this, mm. this gentleman loves being in front of crowds, like loves getting the energy of being at a microphone or being in front of a group, but he's simultaneously afraid that nobody wants him there and that they're all judging him. Mm. And so he is a great example of somebody who is, who is socially anxious, but also really extroverted. And then I think people often conflate introversion and social anxiety because it is fairly common to see folks who are both who you know get their energy by recharging and being being alone or in smaller groups, but are also um, also have this fear of social situations, which could be generalized or could be very very specific. Absolutely, my um, my friend Jennifer Grimes for her master's thesis, she went behind the scenes backstage after Ozfest with the you know the heavy metal musicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she took them aside, and she specifically her research was on introversion and. Um, highly sensitive people mm -hmm. traits, highly high sensitive traits. And she found a very high proportion of highly sensitive traits amongst the um, the uh, rockers. And, and backstage, back, and I'll send you the article about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I'd love well, to see for that. her research, she found that backstage, so many of them, this is literally, they just performed on the loudest. They would say things like, oh, I really can't stand loud noises. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they literally, they would say this after they just performed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but they but say that's a way of for them to if they can control it as long yeah. as it's not spontaneous then it's yes. okay but if they when they're on stage they're in control of it and that was different to them for some reason then absolutely yeah, yeah. i've met a lot of both introverts and so socially anxious folks who say if they have a role and so i actually i talk about this in the book as well if if they have some structure and a role to play that takes away uncertainty and uncertainty is what drives anxiety. And so if they know what to do, like they, you know, they have this, they can, they can play the kind of persona of this heavy metal rocker or, you know, whatever it is they're supposed to do, that, that is much more comforting. And so structure here, like in, in, in the book, I talk about this wonderful study by um, the Australian researchers, doctors, Simon Thompson and Ron Rapay. And so they had uh, a study where they compared women who had social anxiety and then women who were like on the the kind of above average, confident, chatty, and, and they took these two groups of women and one at a time sent them into this experiment that, unbeknownst to them, started as soon as they stepped in the waiting room. Because this male research assistant would come in the room and sit down and just say, I hope we don't have to wait too long. You know, he was pretending to be another participant. And then he would just roll with whatever conversation came up. And if they talked, that was great. And if not, every 30 seconds, he prompted them again with like another, you know, just quip or, you know, comment. And, and they saw what kind of, you know, social interaction ensued. All right, so that was for five minutes. And then after that five minute chunk, a researcher came in and said, okay, thank you guys for coming. You know, so glad you're here. Here's our experiment. In the next five minutes, I'd like you to pretend that you're at a party and are getting to know each other as well as you can in five minutes. Go. And so now these women had had some structure. They had a role to play. They had, a, a, you know, they, they knew what they were supposed to do, had a purpose. And so after the whole study was over, they had raters view videotapes of the interactions and rate the women on their social competence. And so in the first five minutes, when it totally unstructured, of, it, naturally, the women with social anxiety rated quite a bit lower than the kind of overly, not overly, but con confidently chatty women. But in the second five minutes, when they had a mission, they were almost neck and neck. And I, I like to stress that that the folks with social anxiety, again, did almost as well as the people who were above average in terms of their 
confidence and ability to just chat with a stranger. Whoa. So that really struck me and has really stayed with me um, in terms of just, you know, give you both, both helping my clients, but also for me, you know, like I, I use, I like to say that I'm not, not only the author of how to be yourself, I'm also a client, you know, it's like the hair club for men <laughs> from the eighties. And so like, I, I use all these techniques when I go to a holiday party, I'm, I'll think like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to talk to three new people or, you know, just, I, I give myself a little mission and that makes things so much easier. Oh gosh, I love that so much. Yeah, you talk about in your book about research is me search and yes, uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, I love that. Um, I'm a client too, you know. Like I, I, I would not want to propose any sort of exercises for people that I haven't tried myself. Sure. Um, yeah, you. My mind is based on that that study you're just talking about. My mind is uh, brimming with like 47 different directions to go in right now, um, and I want to just like commit to one right now. So I'll do sure. that. Sure. Um, <laughs> okay. You know the the highly sent. You know you talk about. Um, well, okay, let me go. Let me go here. Are you familiar with the recent research on the genetics of um, uh, what are called orchid dan the orchid dandelion yes. hypothesis? I I know the yeah. orchid dandelion hypothesis. Yeah. I don't know if I know the genetics, yeah. but I know what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. So what I find so interesting about that research is that you can find. Uh, particular genes that under particular environmental conditions lead to mm. high anxiety, mm, but mm-hmm, but mm. but which those same genes under um, supportive conditions lead to higher levels of exploration than anyone oh, else wow. that doesn't oh, have that gene. Oh, yeah. Cool. So I I I'm just I think that relates a little bit to the study that you just described. It matters so much for people. You know the context matters, and the framing of the mm-hmm. of what your of what your trait is matters because people who have this um, have these genetics um, have a heightened vigilance. But they can. But if if you actually um, you have the if you convert that vigilance to like curiosity, mm-hmm. it actually can lead to great creativity. It can lead to absolutely. right a lot of a lot of great things in life. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Cause, no. Absolutely. Because I think yeah, under the right conditions, I think because yeah. we okay. So we're all we're all born. Let's just take anxiety. So we're all born with you know some greater or smaller tendency to be anxious. We all have like the 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 raw play doh, you know, of of like <laughs> being anxious about something to a, to a degree. But then our experiences really shape that play doh into whatever it's going to look like. And so if we're born with a larger tendency to be anxious, then our experiences are going to mold that into either, you know, a tendency or to mold it either to into social anxiety or, you know, perhaps, you know, generalized anxiety or OCD or, or whatever. But um, yeah, but I think that also our experiences can mold it the other way into the, yeah, the flip side of those things or both, you know, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Totally. It does not have to be. That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, going back to just the Aaron's, uh, Lean Aaron's concept of the highly sensitive person, mm-hmm. from a personality perspective, I find that her scale is almost perfectly correlated with neuroticism. Mm. Um, so mm. that's, I think that's a lot of the, the trait dimension we're talking about here when we're talking about the, what you're talking about in your book stems from neuroticism, domain of personality. But I do also find it very interesting. There is this consistent correlation that pops up in all my data sets between neuroticism and openness to experience mm. and, and and artistic interests and sort of like beauty, like appreciation of beauty. And, and you know, and, and some of those items are even on a lean scale, which is why she found that it's a coherent scale. So yeah. I think that's an interesting, interesting correlation um, that, you know, I'm just trying to wrap my head around sort of what's, what's driving that commonality, but sure. it's, uh, I guess yeah. my, my riff on that would be, it's a tendency to feel deeply and whether that's a tendency mm. to feel yes. negative emotions deeply, negative experiences deeply, or to f- feel deeply with, when it comes to the awe of standing on the edge yeah. of the Grand Canyon or the, the, the wave of emotion you get when you stand in front of a great piece of art, you, you feel everything deeply. I think you nailed it. Um, that's, 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 that, that, that's, that is what it is. You know, my, um, my dissertation was, um, trying to break up the openness to experience domain into its mm. component, into its components. Mm. Mm-hmm. And one of the, one of my components was a, a what I called effective openness, mm. openness to both the positive and negative emotions within yourself. Now that wasn't, um, that's different than neuroticism, but it was actually an aspect sure. of openness. Okay. Um, and that was correlated with all those other forms of openness as well, you know, as well as compassion. Um, and, uh. 
and yeah, so I think yeah, it great great stuff, great stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, I I I love. I mean, I people with social anxiety are my favorite clients. I, I I'm a generalist, and I you know I, I work with everybody, but um, sure. the folks with social anxiety are near and dear to my heart because they're often just wonderful people. They they are compassionate, and they are um, you know open to to experiences and again care deeply about about others so it's you know it's it's a it's a nice nice bunch to work with and it's especially great to help them realize that about themselves are they more fun to work with than your grandiose narcissistic patients (laughs) (laughs) they're easier i i have a better time with the internalizers i do have to admit it's 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 easier to work with the 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 people who are depressed and anxious than than those who are acting out acting out Yeah. yeah Right, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, let's let's talk about some uh, practical things. Um, yeah. So um, you talk about he- you say Eva phrase heading out into the world, um, which even like that concept itself could trigger some of our more socially anxious listeners, right? Just oh, the sure. thought of having to head out into the world. So maybe right. you could um, give some uh, talk about some of the things you talk about to how to kind of get your confidence and um, and kind of getting in touch and with that built that true self again as you talk about. Absolutely. So one of the things that I like to um, kind of set expectations with clients with is that so uh, many people will come in and say, okay, I wish I could just like kind of hit pause on my life and retreat (laughs) and like work on my confidence and feel better about myself. And then I could hit play again and go out into the world and live my life. And I always say that's awesome. And let's do that in the opposite order. Let's uh, have you go out and live your life like before you're confident and your confidence will catch up. And so like a nice analogy I like to use is that of mood and action. Like we often have, we, we often think we have to feel like doing something before we do it. You know, we have to feel inspired before we sit down and write, or we have to feel like, you know, going swimming before we actually go to, you know, do some laps. And that that's not actually true. If we actually just go and get started, often our mood catches up. We're glad we did it. We're happy we're there. Inspiration strikes as we're kind of going through the motions. And so it's the same thing with confidence. So I like to tell people to um, to, to start before they're 100% ready, like stretch a little bit, go a little bit outside of your comfort zone. And that will refute the two biggest lies that anxiety tells you. One, is that the worst case scenario is a foregone conclusion and will absolutely happen. And two is that you can't handle things, that you can't handle what life throws at you. And so by getting some experience under their belt, they learn, oh, that wasn't so bad. And oh, I was able to to roll with with things. And and then that makes that makes that builds confidence. And then they're ready for the next thing. So um, so that's that's one thing I do to set expectations. Um, we talked about giving yourself some structure. And then a third biggie is to try to turn attention inside out. So like we talked about at the beginning, when we're in a socially anxious moment, our attention often turns inward and we start to monitor ourselves, and we start to monitor ourselves for mistakes, especially. Mm-hmm. And so if we can turn our attention outward and focus on where we are in the moment, so we can focus on the person we're talking to, we can focus on you know the envi- the group around us, the environment around us. We can listen very closely to what the other person is saying. Then that frees up a lot of bandwidth, and we can fill in that remaining bandwidth with just like natural curiosity, uh, natural interest, our authenticity, and that makes us not only feel better, but in studies, if you ask um, Confederates who are are like research assistants who are in in the study talking to the participants, th- those, those research assistants rate the participants as more likable. They wanna be friends with them more than people who, um, who are kind of inwardly focused. And, um, and, and so they just, they just come across better. They rate them as also more, uh, more authentic. So it's a, it's, a, it's a win-win situation. You feel better and you also come across better by turning your attention outward. That's great. So a lot of this is really getting out of your own head and getting outside yourself. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love exactly. that. Um, so should we bust some myths of social anxiety? Sure. Uh, um, 
you know, the, the, a lot of people have this feeling like, you know, I have to sound sm- like a lot of the, like the shoulds, you know, like Karen uh, Horne again talked about yeah. this back in the like the, the tyrant, the tyranny of the shoulds is what Karen Horne oh, called. Talk, such called a rephrase. Yeah, I love that. I, I think that she's really underrated. Um, but, um, you, know, you, you know, like people like there's some, like a lot of oldies, but goodies, you know, in the psychoanalytic mm-hmm, literature mm-hmm. that yeah. are discussed. But maybe you could talk a little about, um, you know, how does this perfectionism hold us back? Sure. Yeah. So perfectionism is a huge driver of social oh, yeah. anxiety. And so, I mean, I can relate to this. Like, I, you know, I, after a PhD in clinical, clinical psychology in several decades, you know, I'm much more comfortable than, than I used to be. But, um, but definitely I realized that, that over the years, the, that perfectionism had really driven a lot of my own anxiety in thinking that like, I, yeah, I had to be entertaining. I had to sound smart. I couldn't like, I had to carry the conversation for both of us if, if I was talking to, to one other person. And so just the realization that, you know, your social life or, you know, conversation is not like a laser maze, you know, like alarms don't go off if you make one mistake was, is, is so helpful. And so I, I quote Dr. David Burns in the book who wrote the first uh, evidence-based self-help book way back in 1980 for depression. Um, and, uh, and so he has a chapter in there called Dare to be Average. And I love that nice. phrase. So it, it helps us lower the bar and realize it's okay to pause in conversation. It's okay to lose your train of thought. It's okay to have an awkward moment. It's even okay to you know, spill your drink on somebody. You apologize and you move on. And, and, and again, bringing back Kristen F., like this common humanity, we're all in this together. And I'm sure that everybody has had drinks spilled on them at some point as well. So <clears throat> to be able to, to dare to be average and not have to perform, as it were, makes things so much easier. What if you're intentionally, like, what if you're a grandiose narcissist and you're intentionally pouring drinks on people? Like, that's, that's not that's okay. A, that's, that's another problem, a, right? Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not, it's <laughs> yeah. not always okay. <laughs> it's not, not always okay. For, okay. for our audience, it is okay. I'm okay. imagining not any grandiose narcissists are listening to this. <laughs> Okay, good for for this audience. Okay, um, I always I always ask Chris and F that question. Like she was on my podcast, and I was just like, you know, like sometimes some of this language can get too um too uh, like you know like you know you're perfect the way you are. You right. don't, and I'm like, like eh, is that true? Yeah, like, not too much. yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, there's a common humanity there in the sense that yeah. none of us are perfect the way we are. No. You know, like, do, do you know That's what I mean? Like, sure. so yes. when we say you're perfect yeah. the way you are, I kind of roll my eyes a little bit because I'm like, you know. <laughs> Speak for yourself. I'm not right. as perfect the way I am. I, Wait, well, I have as much to work on as anybody else. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I got the same problems. Um, okay, cool. And then, so what's the myth of hope in a bottle? Oh my gosh. So this is so this is this is so common. So folks with social anxiety will drink to make themselves feel better in in social situations. And quite honestly, like many people do this. You don't even have to have diagnosable social anxiety or anyway this is this is you know pre-gaming is a thing like people routinely they would have a drink before they go out to loosen up they call it liquid courage and so it's just so common but then when you have especially for folks with social anxiety if they then have um have a have a good time or they feel better then alcohol gets the credit and and so what we want is we're certainly not i'm, I'm not anti-alcohol i'm not telling anybody to stop drinking but um, what I am saying is that you have that confidence in you, and it's just the inhibition that's getting in the way. And so to to try to step to try not to give alcohol the credit and to have a drink because you want to, not because you think you have to. Nice. So that's that's a distinction. Yeah. Yeah. So much about the shoulds or the have. So much have about to. shoulds. Yeah. 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 No, I love that. Um, I, I thought of a question I want to ask you. Well, first of all, this is, this is going to drive me crazy until I ask you, how can you do laps without swimming? <laughs> first. This is, a good, this is a good question. <laughs> okay. That's one question. Because yeah. you said okay. earlier, you said some, some of us want to do the swim first before we do the laps. Oh, like, but don't, well, don't, you need to, don't you need to do that first? Uh, okay. Well, like, clearly, my brain, my brain did one no, thing in my mouth. No, no, thing? No, no. One of those. So. I'm but, just being uh, cheeky. Yes, that's just no me worries. being cheeky. That's okay. that's that, that, that's my real self being cheeky. Very good. Um, and I'm not going to be self-conscious about that now. Okay. Amen. Uh, second of all, okay. Um, uh, I wanted to talk to you about um, sex differences, gender differences. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's I think it's interesting um, to think about in this in this particular domain because 
um, like it seems from my perspective that most of the audience of people that like are attracted to like Brene Brown's message, for mm-hmm. instance, mm-hmm. about vulnerability. Mm-hmm tend to be women. And I wondered if maybe you could talk a little bit about maybe what are some unique um, needs or maybe like being a woman, like growing up in certain environments and kind of being treated Mm. a certain way by the world, et cetera, et cetera, that you think Mm. might cause that gender difference. Or maybe maybe I'm imagining the gender difference. You can tell me that too. Yeah. Sure. Sure. No, that's, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, so one thing, so uh, the cover of my book has this woman in a party dress, like hiding behind some balloons in it. So it's this very, it's like got purple lettering. So it's this very feminine cover, but don't let the cover fool you. This is for, this is for everybody and social anxiety disorder. So what I call capital S social anxiety, which is when it gets in the way of living your life or kind of crosses this line into being impairing, um, is one of the few anxiety disorders that is actually equal opportunity. And so an equal number of men and women suffer from social anxiety disorder. So it's, again, this is really for everyone. Um, and, uh, And so I think that beyond that, when you talk about anxiety in general, um, there is, I think, I think the recent stats are like there's a two to one ratio of women to men who are anxious. But I, I think that a lot of that is driven by self-report and who's willing to say I am anxious and who oh, shows up for therapy and who shows up to get medication or who, you know, who's even willing to, um, uh, in their own head, interpret what they're feeling as anxiety. And so I think for a lot of men, anxiety might manifest as irritability mm. or um, or anger um, and might also come out uh, kind of secondarily as substance abuse. And so it, it, it I think that even though social anxiety is, is equal opportunity already, I think maybe other anxiety disorders and anxiety in general might be closer um, to 50-50 than we think. That's so interesting. Uh, that that point you just made about how um, a lot of men might have this, but not conceptualize it at, mm-hmm. in the same way as women. Like, like, right. does it, like? I think it's undeniable that women are um, tend to be more attracted to like uh, to like Brene Brown's kind of mm-hmm. writing, and maybe yep. even yours. Um, uh, but that doesn't say like maybe a lot of more men would be attracted to it if they like identified with it more you know, like as anxiety. Like, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're just having me think of that now. So thank you for that elucidation. Sure. I really appreciate that. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. And I just have one last question of course, um, no. about okay. the, um, like, Oh, cool. Yeah. But I want to be respectful. <laughs> I want to be, <laughs> sure, sure, um, sure. The you know, you talk about the building blocks of be, quote, beautiful friendships. I, I want mm. some beautiful friendships. I'm, I'm uh, down with that. So, sure. but, but what, but what are the, but why are those building blocks? Maybe not what we think they are. Sure. So, um, so for folks with, who are socially anxious or more prone to social anxiety, so we tend to hold things close to the vest. We tend to not really talk about ourselves, not reveal much. And that's actually a mistake. And so, because relationships, intimacy, um, you know, not necessarily sexual intimacy, but just getting to know another person is, um, and this Elaine Aaron talks about this, is mm. gradual and reciprocal. And so that means revealing a little bit about what you think and do and feel and then you will likely get back something about what the other person thinks and does and feels and it doesn't have to be a confession it doesn't have to be your deepest darkest secret it doesn't have to be your life story you know something talking about something as simple as the weather can be a disclosure you can say like oh i'm so glad it's raining today because i find the gray skies really soothing or Um, I'm, you know, oh, it's finally sunny. I'm so glad that I've been getting, I've totally been having cabin fever. That's a disclosure. That's talking about yourself, even though technically you're still talking about the weather. And so to, to, to talk about oneself, um, is, is part of building a friendship. Another thing is to just keep showing up that it's, it takes approximately on, on average six to eight conversations, like real conversations, not just, Hey, 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 um, before someone considers you a friend. And so, a Is lot that of, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I always like, stop at five, and I wonder if something <laughs> was wrong with me. Yeah, now, now you have the missing link. Exactly, you figured it out. So, um, so what happens is that because of uh, because it's driven by perfectionism, a lot of folks with social anxiety 
go into a social situation and expect to connect instantly with a new, with a potential new friend, like with a stranger, or they expect to go to an event and like walk out arm in arm with, you know, a new buddy. And that doesn't happen. And so what we have to do is to have repetition, to keep showing up over and over. And that means that the places where you want to meet people are where you see the same people over and over like this, what I call like the steady drumbeat of the same faces. So like meetups where the crowd changes every time are actually is actually not a good place. Right. But if you if you go to a dog park, you know, with your dog at you know, and the same people are there every morning, that's perfect. Or if you drop off your kid at school and the same parents are there, that's perfect. So things things like that where you see the same people over and over. Would it um, be creepy for me to go to a dog park even though I don't have a dog, but I just want to make friends? Borderline creepy. You could have yeah. it would be creepier if you had an invisible dog or claim to do that. So. I'll tell I'll tell them that I have an invisible one. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Sorted and, sorted. Yeah. Right, right. Um and but I think the the most important thing to for making friends is that a lot of again people who are socially anxious think they have to project this image of being confident and competent and like that that is what people are looking for but that's not actually true what people are looking for in a potential friend is warmth is simply being kind and trustworthy and loyal and you don't have to be impressive and you don't even have to be confident you just have to be nice and so that that is a, a really important kind of um thing to get one's mind around uh, when we think about making friends so Such repetition disclosure be nice. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and you know, it can it, being too overconfident anyway, it backfires. People don't want to be friends with people who right, right. think they, they just rode in on a high horse, right? Is that a, is that a metaphor? Yeah. I'm bad with metaphors. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll take. So yeah, yeah. People, people want to be friends with people who are human, not superhuman. Right. Yeah. What, what you what you said? Whether <laughs> <laughs> oh, not they're on a horse, yes. Right, yeah, yeah. Forget the horse thing, or yeah. <laughs> well, or not, they came to the dog park riding a horse. There you uh, go. I don't know. Anyway, hey, thank you so much for the chat. This was delightful, and I wish your book all the best. You and the book all the best. Yeah. I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much for chatting with me. It was a delight. Delight for me too. Okay. Should I, should I be like cut? I don't know.